Okay, dear students, this is Mustafa Ahmed Mirchawala, your FR trainer. And today we are going to discuss the latest questions of ACCA Study Hub. As you all know now, we have resources on ACCA Study Hub. So we are going to practice some OT cases, right? Okay. And I hope you are also doing, you are also working hard for this. So let's start. So we have the first question. The name of this question is Will Rob. It is also available in your ACCA study hub. You can take it online as well. So Willrock company has following research projects at 31st March X7. So this is very important. Always in financial reporting, always, always your reporting date is very, very, very important, right? Okay. So 31st March X7 means the accounting period is like 1st of April X6 to 31st of March X7. This this should come in your mind automatically, right? Now, project number 324. The project commenced. The project commenced in April X6. Now wait, let me make the whole sketch. See, this is 1st April X6. April, May, June, July, August, September. October, November, December, then Jan, wait, Jan, Feb, and March. Okay, this is 31st of March, X7. So this is your whole accounting period. Now read it. The, read the question. The project commenced on 1st April, X6, and incurred total cost of 15 million. 15 million during the period 31st December, X6, on a pro rata basis. Now, what does it mean? From 1st April, from 1st April to this 31st December, from 1st April to this 37th December, total amount spent is 15 million. Total amount spent is 15 million dollars on pro rata basis means uh, there are total nine months from April to December. From April to December, it's basically nine months. So in nine months you spent, in these nine months you spent like 15 million. So what you will be doing 15 divided by 9. You will be doing 15 divided by 9. 15 divided by 9. So you will get per month amount. Per month amount. Now it is written on 30. And now the turning point on 30th June X6. The directors were confident that the project met the capitalization criteria according to IS 38 intangible assets. Now listen to me. Listen to me. This is the date. Listen, from from till 30th June X6, the directors were not confident. That means in April, May and June, these three months, April, May and June, these three months capitalization criteria was not met. Capitalization criteria was not met. Capitalization criteria was not met. And yes, from now onwards, July, August, September, October, November and December, capitalization criteria is met so we are going to capitalize for these six months we are going to capitalize for these six months okay and these three months expense now use your common sense total there are 15 million 15 million is the cost for nine months from 1st of april x6 to 31st december x6 x6 total amount spent is 15 million and this 15 million is for nine months so how get, how are we going to split between three and six months? So 15 multiplied by three upon nine, this 5 million, this 5 million is for this period. This 5 million is for this period. And obviously 15 into six upon nine, the 10 million is for this. This is the asset. Okay. So out of this 15 million, out of this 15 million for nine months, 15 million is obviously for nine months. 5 million is for first three months, which is definitely expense because the criteria, the capitalization criteria has not met. And yes, for these six months, it's an asset. Now, hope you remember the lectures. The lecture says that the standard says once you completed the project and once you launch it, once you complete it and launch it, then from that date, if the life, if the life of that project is finite, if the life of that project is finite, then you you can then you can then you can amortize then you have to amortize it then you have to amortize it from the date when from the date when the project is available for use now look at the screen the project completed yes the project completed the project completed 
and began and began to generate revenue from 1st January X7. Okay, so from this date, from this date, it is estimated that project will gen generate revenue for five years. This is the life. Finite life is finite life is five years. Okay, but the scenario is we have just used this project in this accounting period for only three months. We have just used this project. We have just taken benefit from this project in this accounting period for only, only three months, like January, Feb, and March, like January, Feb, and March. Okay. So can you tell me what is our asset? Our total asset? Our total asset is 10 million. See, this is the asset. So how are you going to calculate the amortization for three months? Can anybody tell me? The amortization for three months. Yes, it's very easy. 10 million is the total capitalized development cost. 10 million is the total capitalized de development cost divided by five years. Divided by five years. So you will get per annum. See, amortization per annum is 10 divided by five years. Just think in the denominator, in the denominator, you have written years. You have written years. So it's 10 divided by five. 10 divided by five. It's 2 million. So it's 2 million per annum. But yes, we are using only for 3 months. So 3 upon 12. So it's going to be 0.5 million. Okay. So this 0.5 million is the amortization. This 0.5 million is the amortization. This 0.5 million is the amortization. Okay. Now, one question for this. Let me, let me scroll down the screen. I'll tell you one question that how much will be going in the PNL? How much will be going in the PNL? Like from the, this whole accounting period, from first April to thirty first March, what things will go in the PNL? Listen, this thing will definitely go in the PNL because for April, May, and June the criteria did not met. The recognition criteria, the capitalization criteria did not did not meet. So this five million will definitely go. In the PNL, in the PNL, right? Okay. And this 0.5 million is the amortization. This 0.5 million is the amortization. So it will also go in the PNL. Okay. So for the whole year, for the whole year, what amount will go in the PNL? It's 5.5 million. What amount will go in the PNL? It's 5.5 million. Let me teach you one extra thing just, just for your concepts. Your total asset, listen to me. Your total asset at this stage, when you completed the project, when you completed the project, the total asset was 10 million. And then there is an amortization of 0.5 million. So 10 minus 0.5, if somebody asks you the NDV at the year end, it's going to be 9.5 million. If somebody asks you NDV at the year end, it's going to be 9.5 million. It's going to be 9.5 million. It's going to be 9.5 million, right? Okay. Is this correct? But they are, they might not ask about the NDV thing. Okay. So let me scroll down and let me show you the question. Wait. Yes. See, this is the question. Point number three. In accordance with IS 38, be active, don't sleep, please. In accordance with IS 38 intangible asset, what is the charge? What is the charge to the statement of profit and loss for the year ended 31st March X7 in respect of project 324, the project which we just did? The answer is 5.5 million A. The answer is 5.5 million A. 5 million is the research, research thing or development without criteria and 0.5 is the impairment. So 5.5 is the answer for question number three. 5.5 is the answer for question number three. Now there are two questions which are simply general theoretical question. Let's, let's do that question first. Let's do that question first. And then we'll, we'll be reading the other projects as well. Okay. So now, which two of the following are required by IS 38 intangible assets in relation to the amortization of the intangible assets, excluding, excluding goodwill. Okay. Just remove the goodwill and think over it. Number A, intangible assets should be amortized over the expected useful life, expected useful life or not at all in the useful life is deemed to be indefinite. Looks perfect, right? Listen. 
if the if intangible asset has a finite life yes then we need to amortize it if we all have studied in our studies that if intangible asset has a finite life if intangible asset has a finite life intangible asset has a finite life then we need to amortize it but if it is an indefinite life then you cannot amortize it then amortization is not possible so a looks fine a looks fine but still we need to read other things a looks fine b intangible asset should be should not be amortized should not be amortized but instead reviewed for no 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 this is perfect wrong it's wrong intangible assets only those in intangible assets should not be amortized those who have indefinite life so this is incomplete sentence wrong sentence b is wrong c intangible assets should be amortized on the basis of the of, of the expected pattern of the consumption of the expected yes this is perfect yes this is the logic of amortization this is the logic of matching principle just think if you have an intangible asset and that intangible asset is giving is going to give you more economic benefit in first two years and less economic benefits in last three years if you have and just think my words if you have an intangible asset which is going to give you more economic benefit in the first two years and less economic benefits in the last three years so definitely now the reducing balance method is better now the reducing balance balance method is better in which you will depreciate or amortize more amount in the starting years and less amount in the ending years so this is perfect we the objective is the objective is matching principle we need to match incomes and revenues we need to match incomes and revenues right okay So A looks good and C looks good. Now let's read the D. Intangible assets should not be amortized or impaired or and instead simply carried forward. No, 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 no. They should be amortized if, they, if it is a finite life and there, there is an impairment thing as well. So D is absolutely wrong. So B and D is absolute wrong. So A and C is perfect. Uh, the answer for question number one. Answer for question number one. Now, Okay, question number two, which two of the following statements are true in relation to IS 38 intangible assets? IS 38 requires the revaluation of intangible asset where a company has chosen to revalue its intangible non-current assets, its intangible non-current assets. Now listen, do you think it's correct? hope you remember the revaluation model of IS38. Let me recall you. There are two models in IS38, cost model and revaluation model, but the uh, there is a big difference. There is a big difference between IS38 revaluation model and IS16 revaluation model. Listen, in IS38 revaluation, you can only, you can only go for revaluation if active market, if active market for that intangible asset exists if active market for that intangible ex asset exists otherwise you can't go otherwise you can't do it otherwise you can't do it right so what they are saying see is38 requires the revaluation of intangible asset where a company has chosen no no it's not about your choice there is a requirement also there is a requirement also that only revaluation model for intangible asset is allowed when there is active market. So this looks shady. <clears throat> so let me see the other options. Now the B. IS38 does not permit revaluation of any intangible assets in any. No, 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 no. This is perfect wrong. There in revaluation is allowed. IS38 allows revaluation of intangible asset, but if active market of that intangible asset exists. So these are absolutely wrong. Absolute wrong. Now IS. IS 38, <clears throat> IS 38 permits the revaluation of intangible asset only if there is an active market for, yes, this is perfect, C is perfect, C is perfect. Now D, IS 38 requires that the in initial recognition of intangible asset 
must be at cost. Yes, in ten, you go and read the IS. Even my lectures, I write on the very starting point. Intangible assets are initially recorded at cost. Initially, always they are recorded at cost. Even the IS 16 asset, IS 16, IS 38 assets, they are initially recorded at cost. Yes, the models, the cost model and revalue, the further cost model and the revaluation model, the choice of revaluation is for further measurement. The choice of revaluation is for further measurement not initial recognition at initial recognition when you buy the asset when you acquire the asset it, whether it is intangible asset or the property plan and equipment it must be recorded at cost don't forget this is a technical issue so c and d is perfect a and b is wrong <clears throat> now before we move on now we need to read the other projects as well. Now we need to read the other projects as well. That is project number 325 and 326. Project number 325 and 326. Now let's start. The project commence 325. We are doing 325. The project commence on 1st September X6. You keep your accounting period in your mind. That is April X6 to March X7. Your accounting period is april x6 to march x7 okay your accounting period is april x6 to march x7 so we have started this project on 1st september x6 please dates are important cost of 20000 per month were incurred until 31st january x7 so it's september october november december and january five months we incurred 20000 per month cost till next five months when the project was abundant, see, the project is abundant. That means we cannot do it. We cannot complete it. We cannot, there is there is a law. There may be some law have been passed or there is some technological issue with which we don't have. There is a technology which we don't have or anything or there is a war or something. So now simple conclusion is this. We cannot make this asset. So that means no future economic benefit. In that case, in that case, this amount will be booked in the PNL. This amount will be booked in the PNL. We cannot book assets. Simply, it will go in the PNL. Now, the specialist equipment, the specialist equipment that had been purchased for project number was transferred for use in the another research projects. Yes, that plant, that specialist equipment is your asset. Yes, it's a non-current asset. And yes, whenever, listen to me, whenever you use it, on any project whenever you use a non-current asset on any project the depreciation of that non-current asset will be booked on that project the depreciation depreciation is the expense so yes whenever you use the machine it is depreciated and that depreciated that depreciation that depreciation will go in the pnl as a research cost or that depreciation will go as a develop in the pnl as a development cost or whatever the issue, right? Okay, so plant, specialist equipment and plant, it's a non-current asset, yes, because just think, a specialist equipment has a life of five years or 10 years or 20 years. So this is not reasonable to book the specialist equipment immediately in the PNL. That's not fair, that's not fair, right? So the depreciation amount will go in the PNL, right? Not the equipment itself. So you have read the 325 project 325. Okay. Now just have a slight, slight uh, re walk through on project 326 and then we'll move to another MCQs. Now they are saying the project commenced on 1st January X7, just three months before the year end. The, this is about project 326. Cost of 40,000 per month. Cost of 40,000 per month were incurred until 31st August X7. When the directors is increase, when the directors increase, they spend to sixty thousand. When the directors, when the directors increase, they spend to sixty thousand. When the directors increase, they spend to sixty thousand. Sixty thousand, right? Okay. Now, this is the remaining part. To complete, this is the remaining part. To complete the project quickly as a potential as a potential buyer had identified on 20th July X7, the directors had not been confident that the success of project until this point. See, the directors had not been. The directors had not been confident. That means the criteria not met. The criteria not met on this project. The criteria not met. Okay. So I'm talking about 325 and 326. 
320 project number 325 and 326 both of for both these projects 325 was abundant and 326 the criteria has not yet met okay so you better know what's the treatment let's move to the true and false things see be careful be careful in accordance question number four we are doing in accordance with is 38 intangible assets which of the following is are true or false in respect of the accounting treatments of projects 325 and 326. The cost for the project 325 should be expense in the statement of profit and loss for the year ended 31st March. Yes, it's true because that 20,000 per month cost because the project is abundant and there is no economic benefit expectation. There is no economic benefit expectation, right? Then the specialist equipment which was purchased for project 325 should not be depreciated as it has only been used in our no it, it this is false it should be depreciated because we are using it we are using it it and yes that depreciation will go in the pnl that depreciation will go in the pnl okay because we are constant, we used, we use the specialist equipment on this project as well. We use the specialist equipment on this project as well as other projects. So when you are using it, U-S-I-N-G, using, so it's the deposition is genuine, deposition should be booked. So this one is false. Now the next one, the cost for, the cost for the project 326 should be included as an asset in this, no. This is also false because for project number 326 criteria not met. We just criteria. Let me show you criteria not met for project number 326 criteria not met criteria not met. See, this is the game. See this. Let me show you. This is read the line. The directors had not been confident. See this, this to the success of the project until this point. Okay. So the for four, the first one is true. The other last two is false. The last two is false. Okay, the last one. Now, question number five. During the year ended 31st March X8, Will Drop Company incurred the following cost. 400,000 in the staff cost incurred in updating a computerized records for potential customers. Now, wait, wait, wait. Read the requirement. Which of the above costs would be capitalized as an intangible asset? Now, listen. They are saying that we are making a customer list, potential customers list. So this potential customer list is like a part of internally generated goodwill, internally generated goodwill. And as we all know, internally generated goodwill cannot be capitalized. Internally generated goodwill cannot be capitalized. What is internally generated goodwill? Like we are providing services to good services to our customers. We are attending calls of our customers. We are giving immediate replies to our customers. So all these things makes up your intern, your goodwill, your excellent results, your feedback, everything. This all the part of internally generated goodwill. You have good data of customers and these things. So hope you remember my lectures to, to arrange all these things, to arrange, to giving this services. There are hundreds of costs. There are hundreds of efforts. There are hundreds of efforts by your employees, your team, your CEO, everybody, which cannot be accurately measured, which cannot be accurately measured, right? So you cannot, you cannot even calculate the cost of this internally generated goodwill. 
that's why it cannot be capitalized so this first one this first one cannot be capitalized okay first one the customer list or customer data we are arranging from our employees or we are giving good services to our customers so this is all uh, these all are sort of sort of internally generated goodwill that's why cannot be capitalized okay now second thing is 800,000 for purchase of domain name of the website of a company making substantial online sales yes this is domain name can be capitalized and the logic is see it is going to give you economic benefit because you are going to do online sales you have bought a domain name and that domain name will be used for certain years certain years so there is an there is a clear expected future economic benefit and yes the cost can easily be reliably measured you are buying it for 800000 so it's an intangible asset then next one is 4 million for a patent yes patent purchase to improve improve the production process with an expected useful life of 3 years so patent is your intangible asset so answer is c 2 and 3 only one one cannot be capitalized one cannot be capitalized the i have just giving you the reason one more reason i can give you as you are just in spending on your staff so staff salaries are normally expense staff salaries are normally your expense staff salaries are normally your expense okay so answer is c Okay. So now we are moving towards the next question. The name of this question is chestnut. The following issues relating to chestnut companies, non-current assets are outstanding for the year ended 31st December X7. So the first message is your accounting period is 1st January X7 to 31st December X7. 1st January X7 to 31st December X7. Number one, on 1st January X7, Chestnut Company's factory had a carrying amount of 5 million. Okay, so the NBV carrying amount means NBV at 1st January X7 is 5 million. It has a remaining useful life of 10 years at that date. On 31st December X7, there was an impairment review of the factory and the recoverable amount was deemed to be 2.5 million. The recoverable amount was deemed to be 2.5 million. The recoverable amount was deemed to be 2.5 million. We all know that whenever we do impairment testing, we compute recoverable amount. Chestnut factory had previously been revalued upwards. Yes, excellent. And the revaluation surplus had a credit balance of 1 million relating to this factory. So now, very good. I hope you remember IS 16, IS 16. If an asset goes upward first and then going down, if an asset has gone up and then going down. So with the upward revaluation, we book revaluation reserve. We book revaluation reserve. And when it goes down, when the asset comes down, first we remove, first we cancel. First we remove the revaluation reserve and then we book PNL expense. Okay. So I repeat, whenever an whenever an asset is going to be impaired, and if it has previously been reva revalued, so whatever revaluation reserve you have in the past, whatever revaluation reserve you have in the past, kindly first remove, kindly first remove that revaluation reserve, and then the remaining amount will go in the PNL. Okay. Let me do it for you. So how are you going to do it? Your asset at first January X7. Let me make you a small sketch that will be more user friendly for you. It's basically NBV, but I'm writing cost. Okay. It's first, it's basically NBV, but I'm writing cost. So you have a life of how much? 10 years. So five divided by 10 is 0.5. Your depreciation will be 0.5. It's 5 million divided by 10 years. It's going to be 0.5. So at 31st December X7, your net book value will be 4.5 million. Net book value means carrying value. Now, 
whenever you need to whenever you need to book impairment compare nbv with recoverable amount this is the date of impairment testing 31st december x7 on 31st december x7 we did impairment testing and we calculated recoverable amount we calculated recoverable amount which is 2.5 million which is 2.5 million which is 2.5 million so 4.5 nbv is higher nbv is higher and recoverable amount recoverable amount is lower lower so this will be there is an impairment there is an impairment of 2 million there is an impairment of 2 million there is an impairment of 2 million you know the dialogue whenever the recoverable amount is lower than the carrying value or you can say whenever the carrying value is higher than the recoverable amount impairment is must so there is a there is a 2 million there is a 2 million there is a 2 million impairment right So let's make the entry 2 million is the impairment and previous revaluation reserve is 1 million. So if I make the entry short entry, your non current asset will be reduced by 2 million. Your revaluation reserve previous revaluation reserve will be eliminated by 1 million and the remaining PNL 1 million. This is your impairment expense. Okay. For this 2 million, this is the entry. For this 2 million, this is the entry. Non-current asset or you can, you write the factory or I, I just use the shortcut entry. So non-current asset will be credited by 2. Revaluation reserve will be eliminated and PNL of impairment. This is impairment. Impairment expense, this PNL. Okay. But now examiner may ask the question differently. Examiner may ask the picture for this whole year, for this whole year. So can you tell me what is the total expense for, the, for this whole year? If I say about the total expense, then there will be 1 million. This is impairment and there's a depreciation of 0.5 million. See, 1 million is the impairment expense during the year and depreciation is 0.5. So 1 plus 0.5, 1.5 million will go in the PNL. And yes, the 1 million will be charged to revaluation reserve as there was a as there was a previous revaluation reserve available in this case as there was a previous revaluation reserve available in this case right okay so if examiner asks just about the impairment thing then this 2 million is perfect and this entry is perfect but if if examiner is asking about the depreciation and impairment combined so this this thing as well as this thing okay so there will be total expense of 1.5 let's move let's move to the question part wait just first thing is first thing is general thing general general question let's uh, do this general part which of the following assets belongings to chestnut company require an annual impairment review for there are some things i have taught you in class you guys have studied with your course teachers and everywhere that few things requires annual in impairment review and that is intangible asset with indefinite life or purchase goodwill for that for that things you there is there is at least annually impairment testing is must. At least annually impairment testing is must. Okay. But you have never studied for these tangible assets. So the head office, no, there is no must. There is no permanent impairment requirement, impairment testing requirement for head office or machinery. So it's not A, it's not B. Even both A and both head office and machinery, no. Yes, D is the answer. D is the answer. D is the answer. This is the answer. There is no such requirement. There is no such requirement for annual impairment testing for head office and machinery. We know that. This is the easy part. This is not difficult at all. Okay. Now come to this question. I just, I just gave you the lecture. In accordance with IAS 36 impairment of assets, what is the correct 
what is the correct journal entry to reflect the depreciation and the impairment and the impairment of chestnut company's factory for chestnut company factory for the year ended 31st December X7 for the year ended 31st December X7 for the year ended 31st December X7 right so it's going to be they are asking for depreciation and impairment both so i just told you that revaluation reserve will revaluation reserve or revaluation surplus will be debited by 1 million and in our entry in our entry we were just booking pnl of 1 million pnl of 1 million because i just made the entry of impairment separate but yes there is a 0.5 million depreciation so 1 plus 0.5 is 1.5 this is also perfect and the asset will be credited so a is the answer a is the answer a is the perfect answer because 1 million is the impairment expense which will go in the PL plus 0.5 million is the depreciation. So 1 plus 0.5, 1 plus 0.5 makes 1.5. So 1.5 will be debited to PL, 1 million to revaluation reserve, and definitely the asset will go down by 2.5 million. Okay. The all other options are incorrect. You can see in one option they are crediting the PL perfectly wrong. This is wrong. In this option, they are crediting the PL again wrong. In this option, they are booking complete 2.5 in the PL. That is also wrong because 1 million should be debited to revaluation reserve. Okay, now let's move to the next requirement, definitely. Next move to the next requirement, which is head office, which is head office. Now in this head office part, you hope you remember there is a topic of reversal of impairment. It is part of your F7 FR level course. Reversal of impairment. Yes. Using cost model. Okay. So Chestnut Company head office cost 12 million on 1st of January X1 and is being depreciated. Be careful with the dates. I repeat, be careful with the dates. And, and is being depreciated over 40 years. So initially the life was 40 years and the cost was 12 million. And the date is 1st January X1. X1. Three things keep in your mind. The cost is 12 million. The date is 1st January X1 when we bought it. And the original life is 40 years. On 31st December X4, after four years, after four years, there was, there was an impairment review of the head office and the recoverable amount was deemed to be 9 million. So there will be a clear impairment. First, you have to book impairment. And yes, impairment is an expense, no issue. A more recent revaluation at 31st December X7 has estimated the recoverable amount of the head office is 11C. It first went down and then went up, right? So it means first there is an impairment and then there is a reversal of impairment on 31st December X7. So hope you remember the laws, the rules for reversal of impairment. Uh, just look at these numbers and then Lee, I'll let me move the screen and I'll solve it with you the properly this thing. Listen. Okay, let me do it here. This is 1st January X1. The cost is how much? Sorry, the cost is 12 million. And initially your life is 40 years. Okay. So after four years, see this one is on 1st January X4. After four years, X1 to X2, X3. No, it's 31st December X4. Yes, it's 31st December X4. Sorry.
So 12 divided by 40, 12 divided by 40. What will be the per year deposition? 12 divided by 40. This is going to be 12 divided by 40. Multiply by 4. Multiply by 4. Okay. 12 divided by 40 will be per annum. And there are 4 years. See the gap is 4 years. So it will be. Depreciation will be 1.2. Okay. For 4 years. So 12 minus 1.2. NBV will be 10.8. NBV at 31st December X4 is 10.8. You, sh you should have good mathematics now. And good active mind. Active mind to solve MCQs and OTKs. So your recoverable amount here is, I think, 9 million. Yes, your recover first recoverable amount is 9 million. So tell me, at 31st December X4, your NBV is 10.8 million. At 31st December X4, your NBV is 10.8 million. And your recoverable amount is 9 million. So there will be a impairment of 1 point eight million and this will go in the PNL simple. This will go in the CM PNL as it is. This will go in the PNL expense. Okay. This will go in the PNL. Now the next thing is now the recoverable amount. The asset is brought down to nine million. So this is the real value of asset now nine. And there are after three years. See, this is after three years, which is 31st December x it's going to be 31st december x7 okay now how you are going to calculate future depreciation your original life was 40 years your original life was 40 years your original life was 40 years okay but four years have been passed so 36 years is the remaining life 36 years is the remaining life on, on 31st december x4 so for future depreciation you will be doing like this nine divided by 36 9 divided by 36 is how much let me check it's 0.25 per annum multiply by i think there are three years so 0.25 multiply by 3 is 0.75 so 9 minus 0.75 9 minus 0.75 will give you 8.25 8.25 this is the nbv okay 8.25 this is the net book value okay now the next thing is now the next thing is now the recoverable amount things are changed the, the conditions are better now so now the recoverable amount has changed the recoverable amount is 11 million so this is what we call the reversal of impairment. First went down and then went up. First went down and then went up. Okay. If you have remember my lecture, if you have remember my lecture of reversal of impairment. So in cost model, is the, is the reversal of impairment is allowed? Yes, it is allowed. Yes, it is allowed, but there is a boundary. You can simply reverse it, but there is a boundary. There is a border which you cannot, which you can never cross. There is a border, there is a boundary. There is a border, there is a boundary, which you cannot cross, which you cannot cross. And that border is called historical carrying value. That border is called historical carrying value. And listen, my words now, this is important. Historical carrying value means, historical carrying value means, Carrying value had there been carrying value had there been no impairment in past. Carrying value had there been no impairment in past. Okay. So just think this, this just skip the event of 31st December X4 and calculate the carrying value now. So it's 12 million. See your original cost is 12 million. Your original cost is how much? It's 12 million. And just simply depreciated or uh, divide just divided by 40. And there is a seven years. There is simply seven years deposition you have to calculate. So let me calculate. Uh, wait. So I will do it like this. Carrying value had there. Or I simply write it historical carrying value, simple word. Simple word is historical 
carrying value. So it's going to be 12 million. 12 million was the cost divided by 40. Divide by 40. And yes, seven years have been passed. So I can do it directly by multiply by 33. You can also do it using other ways. So just think seven years have been passed from 1st January X1 to 31st December X7. From 1st of January X1 to 31st, seven years have been passed. And I need to calculate the NBV. I need to calculate the NBV after seven years. So this is the shortcut. 12 divided by 40 multiplied by 33. Okay. So this is going to be weight. Nine point nine, nine point nine. Okay, this is this is the border. Now, what is your what is your current NBV? See, at thirty first December X seven. Listen, the student student, listen to me. At thirty first December X seven, your current NBV is eight point two five. Your current NBV. That means right now, let me make a good sketch for you. Right now, you are at eight point two five, and your recoverable amount. Your recoverable amount is eleven your new recoverable amount is 11 can you simply go to can you simply go to 11 no there is a border let me change the color there is a border this border is called historical carrying value this border is called historical carrying value which is 9.9 .9. i repeat can we do reversal in cost model yes we can do reversal in cost model but there is a border there is a border so you will go up 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 and here the guards will stop you here the guards will stop you this is called historical carrying value you cannot cross this limit you cannot cross this limit because you are on cost model because if you cross this limit you will be entered in the boundaries of revaluation model so 8.25 and 9 point how much is the difference Oh. it's 1.65 although i'm giving telling you how this is this will go in, this reversal will go in pnl this reversal will go in the pnl and the amount to be reported in sofp is 9.9 .9. from 8.25 you will come to 9.9 .9. examiner won't ask i will show you the requirement examiner won't ask you this 1.65 they will just tell you, ask you the value for SOFP. They will just ask you in this question, the value of SOFP. So it's 9.9. .9. It's 9.9. .9. You cannot cross this border. Hope you remember the word of historical carrying value. Or I repeat, the, the, the meaning of historical carrying value is carrying value had there been no impairment in past. Carrying value had there been no, no, no impairment in past. Okay. So just... Take a look for this thing. Okay, now read this. What is the, we have already worked on it. What is the carrying amount of Chestnut Company's head office in the statement of fund at 31st December? Yes, we just discussed it's 9.9. .9. It's 9.9 .9 million, the border, the border amount, which we cannot cross at all. Now you have a general question of government grant because this question is linked to IS20 as well. This question is linked to IS20 as well. Hope you remember in IS20, you have two types of method to spread your government grant. First of all, you listen, hope you remember there was a method in which you make a separate entry for bank debit. Whenever you receive the grant, you make the entry bank debit and deferred income credit bank debit and deferred income credit remember this entry and then you spread then you spread your grant then you spread your grant over the life of the asset this is a method this is the method through which you do deferred income right 
and there is one more method hope you remember the lectures you simply cancel out you simply cancel out the grant in front of that machine you simply cancel out the grant with the machine and you don't book any deferred income you don't book any deferred income you don't book any any deferred income you don't book any deferred income okay so just read it indicate by clicking on the relevant boxes whether the following statements relating to government grants are correct or incorrect are correct or incorrect okay number one the deferred income method should always be used. The deferred income method should always, should always be, no, it's incorrect. We have option. We can use deferred income of, uh, approach, but we can, we can directly cancel the grant in front of the asset. That is the second option as well. So it's not mandatory. It's not mandatory to use deferred income approach always. Grants related to income must be disclosed separately in the statement of as other income no 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 let me show tell you one thing you know for example giving you one example grant related to income for example government has given me government has given me grant related to labor cost government has given me grant related to labor cost that if you hire this much labor you will get this much grant so now i have option i have two options the first option is i book this grant as a separate other income and I can cancel, I can cancel and I can offset or I can set off or I can net off my labor cost with the government grant income and I can book the net labor cost as an expense. That's also allowed. I repeat, you can book it as a separate other income. That's fine. Or you can reduce your expense. That's also fine because reducing expense means you are booking your income. Reducing expense means you are booking your income. So this, this, this option is allowed. So here they are writing. Here they are writing that always you have to book as other income. No, that's not always. Now the third thing is the deferred income method should only be used if the grant is repayable. No, don't you don't please. I have given big lectures on this in my class. You know why we spread the grant? Why, why we make this entry? Bank debit deferred income credit. Why we make this entry? Because of any liability, because do you think we book this entry because in the in future we have to repay the grant? No, this is not the logic. The logic is matching principle. The logic is matching principle because if you don't if you don't make the entry of deferred income, the other option will be PNL. The other option will be PNL. If you don't make the entry of deferred income, the other option will be PNL, and that will be wrong according to matching principle. That will be very bad according to matching principle because this grant you have received for machine and machine will be used for next 10 years, and you cannot book the income of next 10 years in one go now. So that's why we book deferred income. So we book this deferred income because of matching principle, not not because we have to repay this grant. So this is the deferred income method. The deferred income method should only be used if no, no, there's no such requirement. Now the last thing, grant related to asset can be accounted for using either deferred income method or by deducting from, yes, this is correct. Both options available. Both options available, both options available, both options available. And yes, we have done in class the both options. Okay. Now we have one last machinery, which is machine number three. And this is the story of... So this is machine number three. On 1st April X7, Chestnut received a grant. Very simple question. This is the easiest part of government grant. You receive a grant of 2.66 million towards the new production machinery. The machinery cost $4 million and is expected to have a useful life of five years. Now, very important information. Depreciation is charged on straight line proportionate basis. So, very clear. As this is grant related to machine. So the way this machine will be depreciated in the same way this grant will be amortized. You know this. If the machine is depreciated on a straight line basis, 
the grant will also be amortized on a straight line basis. If the machine is going to be depreciated on reducing balance basis, the grant will also be amortized on reducing balance method basis in order to match. The main purpose is matching principle, okay? Now, Testnet company uses the cost model when accounting for its head office and the deferred income method, okay, right? So now, just look at this amount of this grant is 2.6 million. Look at this date of 1st April X7 on your end, your year end is 31st December X7. Now let, let me do some working for you. See, we received grant on 1st April X7. See the screen. We received grant on 1st April X7 and your first accounting period ends on 31st December X7. That is after nine months. These are nine months. And then you have a complete 12 months accounting period. Hope you remember the government grant accounting. We always solve. There are two IS in which we, we do extra one year working. You remember one is IFRS 16. When you make lease amortization schedule, you always do one year extra to, to break the liability into current and non-current. To break the liability into current and non-current. And the second area is government grant. In this, you also break current and non-current. Okay. So 2.6 million initially you received, 2.6 million initially you receive, you will make the first entry, bank debit, deferred income credit. Now let's amortize. Listen, your amortization will be 2.6 divided by life of machine was five years. So if the life of machine is five years, then the grant will also be amortized over five years. So let me do it, 2.6 divided by five. This will be 2.6, 2.6 divided by 5 will be 0.52. This is per annum, 0.52. This is per annum. And now first we need 9 months. So 9 upon 12. So this will be 0.39. Okay. So 2.6 minus 0.39. Sorry, 2.6 minus 0.39. This is 2.21. So at the year end, your total liability, first thing, at the year end, your total liability is 2.21. But you need to split, split this total liability into current and non-current. So now can you tell me, you have to prepare one more extract for next 12 months. And the next 12 months, see, the next 12 months grant will be, amortization will be 0.52. Next 12 months, these are 12 complete months. Your amortization for next 12 months will be complete 0.52. So out of this 2.21, 0.52 will be amortized. So how much will be left? 1.69 will be left. Okay. Now, riddle. At 31st December X7, your total liability, your total liability for deferred income will be 2.21. At 31st December X7, your total liability for deferred income will be 2.21. And out of this 2.21.52 is current. See, let me write the breakup. Your current liability is 0.52. And your non-current liability will be 1.69. Just for your verification, add these two, you will get the total. I think examiner is asking the year-end non-current liability. Examiner is just asking the year-end non-current liability. So at 31st December X7, the non-current liability will be 1.69. The non-current liability will be 1.69. See, this is the... What is the carrying amount of the non-current liability in respect of the government grant? In the chestnut... Statement C, this is 1.69, answer is C. Answer is C. You can check, please. See, the question is also there and solution is also in front of you. So I would say, I would say, listen, the most important thing for these OTQs and MCQs is requirement. Requirement is the dangerous thing. Always see the year end. Always see the year end. Always see whether they are asking total liability or whether they are asking current liability, whether they are asking non-current liability. So be try to read the requirement with a very relaxed mind. Okay. So that's it for today's and hope.
I'm expecting that you guys, you all guys are working hard, whether you are studying from any part of the world. Okay. Thank you.